Okay, everyone, welcome back to chapter 16. Um, this is the second lecture, so you would have just watched chapter 2. Now I'm getting into chapter 16. I'm not really going uh, in chapter order, that's very clear, but uh, putting chapters together that just seem to go together. So we're going to get into Earth and other planets in this chapter. So let's talk about the formation of the solar system. If you walk outside tonight, you look at the sky just after sunset, chances are you're going to find two or three particularly bright objects that stand out among the stars. Even in the haze, the illumination of a city, you're still probably going to see them because they're going to be bright. They might not twinkle like stars, but they actually shine steadily. If you had a pair of binoculars and you looked at it through them, they would appear to be small disks. But if you looked at that same bright object on a, another night, you'd notice that over a period of weeks or months, they might seem to wander across the stars, never appearing in exactly the same place two nights in a row. Now the Greeks, they called them wanderers, or planets, basically, and they assigned them the names of the gods. Now today, we don't use the names of the gods, we use the Roman names. But if you were out there in the evening and maybe the early morning, for example, you might look up and you might see Venus. Venus is named for the goddess of love. Or you might see swift moving Mer Mercury, which moves very fast across the sky and very low in the sky. Mercury is the messenger of the gods. And the night sky is often dominated by Jupiter, the king of the gods. Jupiter is very, very easy to find. Now today we know that those disks of light in the sky are objects similar in many ways to our own planet Earth. They show us that we're part of a system that includes not only Earth, but the Sun, the other planets, dozens of moons, an innumerable amount of other small objects as well. But our probes have visited most of them, landed on several of them, including Mars and Venus. And some of these scientific visionaries will talk of the day when science fiction becomes reality and human beings will work and live on these planets, our nearest neighbors in the cosmos. In every sense of that word, the planets are the next frontier. Now, what you'll learn is that not all of these planets are going to be possible to live on. But let's talk about them in this lecture. The first thing I want to talk about is this idea of a solar system. We're going to call this the Copernican Revolution. That's really what it's called. The, that Copernican Revolution dramatically changes human perception of our place in the universe. Suddenly, rather than occupying what they called the center of creation, Earth now just becomes one of the many planets orbiting the sun. Suddenly, we have a solar system with many planets orbiting the sun, the planets have many moons, and there's all these other objects that are gravitationally bound to the sun. Scientists have been trying, trying for thousands of years to figure out how all of this came to be. But really, until recently, all we've been able to do is observe the objects from Earth. More recently, though, we've got orbiting space probes and flyby missions that have returned close-up photos and information of several planets while spacecraft have landed in Venus and Mars and Saturn's moon, Titan, Pluto, and even a comet. As astronomers gather data, they notice several striking similarities and patterns that can give us clues that, in order to understand the evolution of our home. Let's look at clue number one. Clue number one is planetary orbits. All planets orbit the same direction around the sun, and this is the same direction that the sun rotates on its axis. It orbits in the same plane, like a bunch of marbles rolling around on a single flat dish. Most planets and moons rotate on their axis in the same direction as the planets orbit the sun. So this is just some, the first clue. The second clue is how the, ma the distribution of mass works in the solar system. Most material of the solar system is contained within the sun, and it's only a small fraction of the overall mass in the planets and the other objects that are orbiting. There's two types of planets. There's terrestrial planets, which are the small, rocky, 
high-density worlds that are closest to the Sun, Mercury, Venus, us, Earth, and Mars. And then we have things called the Jovian planets, or the gas giants that are farther out, where the Earth, uh, where the, um, the Sun looks like a little small tiny dot in the sky, like a star. Well, that's what a sun is, is a star, but it looks like one of our stars, not the sun in the sky. And the sun's ability to warm it is very, very minute. And so they're very large, cold gas planets with no land mass to land on. Those are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And then there's other objects. The moons, like I said, asteroids and comets. How about Pluto? What's Pluto? Well, unfortunately for Pluto, since 2006, it hasn't been a planet. But interestingly enough, they des designated all objects that are outside of uh, planet range to be called Plutoids. So there's a win for Pluto in the, in the grand scheme of things. Here's just this example of mass in the solar system where you have your terrestrial planets. Again, these are planets that have hard, rocky surfaces. There's an asteroid belt that's held together here by Jupiter, and here are the Jovian planets, the large gas giants. You can look at the size difference here. Really, really incredible. So all of these clues lead us to the nebular hypothesis. And the nebular hypothesis says that this cloud of dust and gas, which we call a nebula, collected in the region that's now occupied by our solar system about four and a half billion years ago. It was 99% hydrogen and helium, these little small gas particles. And what happens is the nebula collapses under the influence of gravity and begins spinning around really, really fast. Planetary orbits in the same plane as a result of this flattening of the nebula occur. So basically, I'll show you a GIF, and it's going to be a little confusing when I'm talking about it, but hopefully the GIF will show you that this nebula is just under the influence of gravity collapsing, and it starts to spin, and all this material spins out. And so the planetary orbits are now orbiting in the same plane as, as a result of this spinning. You get a clumping of matter that's denser in some areas than others. And these little, well, I say little, but very large, but smaller than planet, um, pieces of material called planetesimals form from the rapid, rapid breakup of the disk. Like I said, these could be boulders to several miles across, but they start to collide with each other and the larger ones capture the smaller ones and they start growing and eventually planetesimals, planetesimals grow into planets. And then temperature differences that develop in the disk, the hotter closer to the sun and the inner and the outer systems make uh, the inner and outer solar systems develop differently from that. The hotter that you are, the more dense and rocky you are, and the colder you are, the more like a gas giant. So here is an example of what that might look like. This is probably like an example of two nebula combining to form one um, solar system, but you could get an example of what that might look like where this big floating giant um, gas cloud starts to collapse under gravity, spin out all of this extra material, and the solar system begins to form in that same plane. So I know it's kind of high level thinking to sort of imagine something as on a grand scale as this, but really interesting nonetheless. As a nebula that forms the solar system collapse, it begins to rotate and flatten into a disk. The stages in the solar system would include something like the slowly rotating nebula, the flattened disk with a massive center that becomes the sun, planets in the process of birth represented as mass concentrations within the nebula. You could probably like see, here's some big mass that flies out that way. That'd probably be a planet. And then eventually what we know as the solar system. Okay, let's just talk about something interesting. Um, how bones react to gravity. So you might think of bones as these very hard structures, but in, in reality, they're actually quite, quite flexible, and they've got to be for you to move around, right? Um, and bones are able to rebuild themselves. We know if you break a bone, you put it in a cast, and it will regrow. But bones also respond to the absence of gravitational stress. How and what happens? 
Well, if you go to another planet, they, it can either have a larger gravitational pull or a smaller gravitational pull. And for example, if you were on a, let's say we eventually figure out how to send astronauts many, many miles away to, to planets we've never thought possible to reach, they will have to be in a lower gravity situation for quite some time. What happens with that is the bones begin to adapt to that lesser amount of gravity and become less dense. Now we see this happen when we get astronauts on, on the space station for quite some time and they come back, their bones are less dense. Thankfully, bones are able to then readapt to a stronger gravitational pull and become more dense. Now what could happen if we send an astronaut out for some unimaginable length of time, two decades or so, and they have to, you know, survive in this little capsule going out to, I don't know, some moon. Well, we'd have to figure out how they could keep their bone density up so that they could walk around. So just something interesting to think about, just how science and life interact. This is just a thinking question. Do you think prolonged time on an orbiting satellite could affect bone mass? Well, I guess I just spoiled it for you. Yes, it will. So how did the Earth form? Well, like I said, there's these planetesimals. They combine to form Earth and other planets. Earth is no different. And then you get this, what is called the Great Bombardment, where Earth gets bombarded by meteor after meteor, and they're coming in at un unimaginable speeds. And that energy, which is kinetic energy, which is the movement energy, the energy of movement, gets transferred into heat energy when these large explosions happen when it hits the surface of Earth. Earth was quite literally a ball of lava, basically a ball of liquid hot red magma. What, causes, what happens is heavy materials like metals and other things would sink down and light ones would rise up. And that results in something called differentiation right here. Differentiation, we'll talk about that in a second. And then you get the growth of into planet Earth into what it is today. 20 metric tons a day falling from space and materials such as meteors hitting the Earth. Each meteor adds an object roughly the size of a grain of sand to our planet. Very interesting. So what is that differentiation? Differentiation, think about oil and water. If you put some oil in water and shake it up, what happens is it will mix, but eventually the oil will rise to the top, the water will be on the bottom. And that's because of density. So you get all this heat from collisions, you get the dense materials that sink to the center, the heavy materials, then the lighter material rises to the surface, and then we get the structure of Earth, where at the core, we believe it to be solid, almost solid iron and nickel metal, heated up to 9,032 degrees Fahrenheit. Above that, we have the mantle, which is this thick layer that contains hot, soft rock that's rich in elements of oxygen, silicon, magnesium, and iron, Fe, that's iron. And then we have the crust, which is the least dense of the materials and relatively a thin, uh, thin layer, but it's what we use for our source of rocks and minerals used in our lives. We've never dug down to the mantle or very much less the core. It would be impossible. Everything we do is within the crust. So here it is. Here's the inner solid core within a, a piece of liquid hot magma stretching for quite some amount of miles. Then the very thick mantle and here's the tiny little crust that we do all of our work on. So how did the moon happen? Well, we call the moon formation the big splash, where a large object, and that's probably understating it, the, an object the size of Mars that was probably competing with Earth, impacts Earth. And this is suggested by computer-based modeling. But what happens is you get large pieces of the mantle getting blown into orbit. And you might say, well, if that happens, where's the crater? You have to remember the Earth was a big red hot ball of liquid magma. So it just melted and you'd never see that there was a big crater the size of the moon there at some point. Moon, the moon formed from this material from Earth's mantle. Now, what we know is that the density of Earth is about five times more dense than water. 
and the density of moon, the moon, is about three times as dense, so it's less dense than Earth. And then if you look in the mantle, you find that the mantle is filled with less dense materials. So how is the low density of moon associated with the Earth's differentiation? Well, since there's less dense materials in the mantle, that provides support for the fact that the moon was formed from the mantle. Here's what that might have looked like. Um, needless to say, there was no living uh, organisms on the planet at this time. It was definitely impossible for any life to sustain what was going on. If there was even any water between bombardments, each bombardment would vaporize the oceans. Um, and so this was just a hellish landscape for many, 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 many years. When could life begin? Well, at the end of the bombardment, because like I just said, while the bombardment was happening, there's no way. That happened somewhere between 4.2 to 3.8 billion years ago. Why is that? Well, the effect of the collisions made it impossible beforehand. And then after that, we get the evolution of our atmosphere. Early on, there's possibly no atmosphere at all. But once it formed, it's going to gradually change into what it is today. And that happens due to outgassing and cooling. When the core of the Earth, or basically the inside of the Earth, started to cool, water vapor, carbon dioxide, and other gases get released from the Earth's interior. That goes up into the atmosphere. This happens to this day. Think volcanic eruption. When a volcano erupts, all of that gas going into the air is that outgassing. It's filled with carbon dioxide, nitrogen, hydrogen, water vapor. That's basically what the atmosphere is. The other thing is gravitational escape, where eventually, after the he getting heated up in the sun, light materials will be able to escape, but the heavy ones, like the gases in our atmosphere, will stay. And then eventually we get the living organisms. One of the first living organisms are organisms that can do photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is a way for an organism that doesn't eat other organisms to get energy from the energy from sunlight. One of the byproducts of photosynthesis is oxygen. The oxygen is actually a byproduct that they release to the environment. And the rest is sort of history there because you understand how oxygen is so important in our atmosphere. Let's talk about exploring the solar system. First, we can talk about the inner solar system. Mercury, Venus, Mars. Now, we've been looking for life. Mercury and Venus far, far too hot for life to exist. Mars, however, not so. In fact, it's cold because of the atmosphere. We've done multiple missions, and we've actually found evidence of water. Here's the Phoenix lander, one of the many uh, probes, uh, one of the many landers that we've sent out. If you can see here, there are some uh, lumps of ice that we found. Water ice, by the way. And where there's water, there is the potential for life. So why are we looking for life on Mars? Well, it's been the case that science fiction has always intrigued us. But the interesting thing about it is that if there really is no other life on Earth, then we know everything there is to know about life. But if there isn't, it can add so much more scientific discovery and give credence to the fact that the way that life on Earth started might actually be how life in general gets started. So it's always been something that we want to look for. Now let's talk about the outer solar system. That's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. They have layered structures just like we do, but they have no solid surface. Jupiter gave us two unique opportunities to study its atmosphere. The first was this bombardment that happened from a number of comet-sized materials. The comet Shoemaker-Levy is what it was called. It collided with Jupiter July 16 through 22, 1994. And it brought gases that would normally be miles below the surface of Jupiter up to the atmosphere so that NASA could study it. And then... Launched in 1989, but arriving in 1995, the Galileo spacecraft went and got to Jupiter. 
It sent a probe down into Jupiter so that we could study its atmosphere even more. Eventually, though, we crashed it into Jupiter so that it wouldn't collide with Europa, which is one of the moons. Saturn, the other uh, one of the gas giants, we've always wanted to explore its moon Titan, and eventually we did with the spacecraft Cassini in 2004. Moons and rings of the outer planets, well, the moons, Io is a moon of Jupiter. It actually has active volcanoes. Europa is a moon of Jupiter, and it has conditions that might be appropriate for life. What we found was that there's a water ice surface that seems to be formed recently. And that's pretty puzzling because it should have been bombarded. But there was no um, evidence of it. And eventually we find that there is bombardment. And when within the bombardment, when the ice is broken, a slushy material replaces it. And so that gives credence to the fact that there is an ocean miles under the surface of the ice um, layer. And so this is a really good chance. I mean, we're still years and years away from getting to Europa and checking if there's any life forms, um, be they single cellular or multicellular, which would be incredible, uh, in the water. And then Titan, which is a moon of Saturn, is sort of considered the museum of early chemical reactions. It's a very, very cold planet. But when we looked on the surface, we saw this black goo. And that black goo is kind of the um, byproduct of organic reactions happening. The type of organic reactions that would lead to life, but would have to happen much, much faster because the temperature would have to be increased. And so it's interesting that it's kind of like a snapshot in the history of chemical reactions that led to, to life. Rings on planet are usually made of ice and rock, and each of the Jovian planets has rings. Okay, let's finish this up talking about asteroids, comets, and meteors. Asteroids are small. Now, compared to planets, they still are quite, quite large, large enough to land um, little spacecraft on them. They're rocky bodies, they're rich in minerals of all kinds, and they orbit the sun. And most of them are found in the belt between Mars and Jupiter, the asteroid belt. Now let's think, would an asteroid collision with the Earth have major, major consequences? Well, maybe you're thinking of the dinosaurs. It's one of the theorized, um, hypothesized reasons that dinosaurs are no longer with us. Very, very solid evidence for that. Um, evidence that I won't get into at this point. But that's probably what happened. What happened is it kicked a bunch of sediment and dust up into the air, pretty much blocking out the sun, causing death of not just the dinosaurs, but the organisms that they eat and the plants that the other organisms eat. And yes, so if that happened today, catastrophic uh, failure would, would occur. Comets. Comets, you can think of them as dirty snowballs. They, they are big uh, pieces of ice, and they might have some rock in it, and they orbit outside of Pluto in the Oort cloud. Oort is just the name of uh, an astronomer far, far away from the solar system, and then in the Kuiper belt by Pluto. Those are the main reservoirs of, of comets. Now, some comets, uh, comets uh, orbit, and they come back and return to the vicinity of Earth, where you can see them just briefly. Halley's Comet, it returns to the vicinity of Earth every 76 years. Happened in 1910, then in 1986. The next one would be 2061, so we've got unfortunately quite a few many years, 41 to be exact, before we might see it again. Stardust and deep impact missions put space probes out to, to gather information about comets. And then meteors. There's meteoroids, meteors, and meteorites. I'll tell you what those are in just a second. But it's this small piece of ancient space debris. Meteor showers happen quite regularly, actually, and you can pretty much figure out when they're going to happen. They're spectacular. They're great to watch. But they're pieces of original solar system material. They can help us find out more about how and when Earth was created and more about the other parts of the solar system as well. So when meteorites crash onto Earth, um, or meteors in general, uh, we, we always try to go get them and, and look at their um, what they're composed of. If you're confused about that, here's an example. Comet 
It's a body of ice, rock, and dust that can be, can be seen several miles in diameter and orbits the sun. Debris from comets is the source of many meteoroids. A meteoroid is a small, rocky, or metal object, usually between the size of a grain of sand or a boulder, and it orbits the sun, and it originates from a comet or an asteroid. Meteor, a meteoroid that enters the Earth's atmosphere and vaporizes, also called a shooting star. A meteorite is a meteor that hits Earth without burning up in the atmosphere, so that's like when you get a meteorite that strikes and leaves a big indentation, and you can go retrieve it, that's a meteorite. A meteor shower is a collection of meteors visible when Earth passes through a trail of debris that's left by a comet. And an asteroid is an object larger than a meteoroid. It orbits the sun. It's made of rock or metal. And historically, objects larger than 10 meteors across have been called asteroids. Okay, guys, I know that was a bit of a longer lecture for a video, but I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something from this, and I'll see you in the next one. Have a good one.